Cairo, Seattle. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal. Every episode will explore someone's perfect last meal to find out which food they find most delicious or nostalgic or comforting or gluttonous. And then we'll explore the history of that dish and more. On today's episode, Moving to the country, I'm gonna eat a lot of peaches. Chris Ballou, lead singer of the four adults band, Presidents of the United States, and the four kids band, Casper Baby Pants, pops by the studio. Can you hear yourself? Yes, I can. Okay. I'm, I'm Radio Man. Radio Man here. I'm Radio Man. Radio studios are fun. Peaches come from a can. They were put there by a man. And for the record, no, Chris Ballou's last meal does not involve millions of peaches. No, I, I get a lot of cans of peaches thrust at me, even these days at the Casper shows. People want me to sign cans of peaches. It's great. I love it. Do you still like eating peaches? Oh, yes. I love them. Also on today's show. Chris Roberts, author of a book about the history of nursery rhymes, digs into the history of the old classic ditty, Yankee Doodle. Parentheses, this will make a whole lot more sense after you hear what Chris Ballou's last meal is. We'll also hear from James Beard Award winning cookbook author Cliff Wright, who tells us which classic American comfort food that pretty much all of us ate as children was introduced to America by President Thomas Jefferson. But first... Annabelle Pancake, she's jumping up and rolling away. In 2009, Chris Ballou started recording and performing kids' music under the name Casper Baby Pants. Now, this was a dream come true for him. This kind of music tapped into the core of his creative personality. I mean, if you think about it, songs like Peaches and Lump that he was doing with the Presidents kind of sound like kids' music anyway. And after years and years of playing rock shows with the Presidents in front of massive 50 to 100,000 person audiences, Chris has happily settled into playing more intimate venues. I like a fluorescently lit library meeting room on a Tuesday morning. So what's the difference of playing for adult rock fans compared to little kids? Actually, not a huge difference. If the adult rock fans are extremely drunk and happy, then they're just like little kids. Because little kids are kind of like drunk, happy grown-ups. And they're so free. They'll just come up and start, you know, walking behind me and take the mics off my amplifier. Or, you know, a lot of times they'll just walk up to me and during a song and be like, excuse me, 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 excuse me. It just goes on until I stop. And then they tell me things like, my jacket is red. <laughs> Why, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> My grandma is mean. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm thirsty. Can I have some water? When it comes to eating, Chris is as healthy as they come. He swoons for squash. He faints for fennel. Chris will voraciously eat vegetables even when they're not a part of an alliterated phrase. But back in the 90s, when Chris was on the road with the presidents, he pretty much subsisted on variations of bread and cheese. Uh, well, even before I was on the road with the presidents, I was a pizza, beer, pasta guy, just all starch and wheat. And of course, I had crazy eczema problems on my hands, and I was tired all the time, and I got tons of sinus infections, and I was run down. Finally, I got a blood test that told me that I was allergic, not allergic, but sort of intolerant to wheat and dairy and eggs and stuff. Once I cleaned that stuff out, just wow, everything got lighter and brighter. And I had more energy and more stamina, and I stayed healthy longer, and I didn't, my skin issues went away, and awesome. So, You're a new man. I'm a nude man. <laughs> <laughs> Deep down under my clothes, I'm a nude man. Chris is 51 years old, tall and slender, with an eczema-free, shiny bald head. He is energetic and funny and fun, and he puts me in the best of moods. Let's talk about the topic that I have you here to talk about, yeah. your last meal. Ooh. What would your last meal be? My last meal would be a ginormous bowl, basically never-ending, because I would get full before it would be over. Like a bathtub? Uh, no, it would have to be like a giant salad bowl. Okay. Full of piping hot elbow noodles with butter and salt and pepper, and that's it. And I would just eat them until I could not eat another bite, because they are silky and delicious and comforting and wonderful. I am so fascinated that you chose elbow macaroni. Yes. Because I feel like that only gets used in mac and cheese or macaroni salad, that it never gets oh. used in other pasta dishes. Oh, no, I use it all the time. You do? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's my staple. Because, see, the thing is I don't do the wheat pasta. So, although for the last meal, I would give it up. My wife and I do this thing where we give it up. Like, the other day I gave it up for a hot fudge sundae. 
<laughs> you got to give it up every once in a while. I Do give you it, say that when you're doing it? Yep, yep. Got to give it up because this hot fudge sundae is sitting in front of me and it's beautiful. And then you just pass out in a state of sugar coma <laughs> and tiredness and well, eczema. The cool thing is if you eat right all the time, most of the time, you can eat bad every so often and your body just goes, oh, that's garbage. Get rid of it fast. And it does. So that's so exciting. When you eat macaroni regularly, do you eat non-wheat pasta? Yeah, I eat Ancient Harvest. They've settled on an amazing formula now for their quinoa pasta, and it is phenomenal. And so the quinoa elbow Ancient Harvest is my staple. And so I currently do that. But if it was my last meal, I would make some Italian dude make me some homemade elbow macaroni, like right out of the thing, right into a pot of boiling water for a second, and then butter and salt and pepper. And then I would just eat and eat and eat and eat. And then I would die. <laughs> <laughs> Gloriously die. I would die. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it about this dish? Is this a comfort food? Where did this come from? You know, I don't know. I've been eating it as a comfort food, as a fun, like my dream is to have it in the pot, which is still hot. So it stays hot longer and uh, watch TV and just eat that. What goes best with quinoa oh, macaroni and butter? It doesn't matter. Anything from a documentary about World War II to The Bachelorette. <laughs> <laughs> I love this because that's one of my comfort foods too because I feel like that's what you give little kids when they won't eat anything yeah. is you just give them pasta with butter I mean yeah it's got to be a universally accepted uh, human food because we give it to upset children who are the hardest to please so it's like the number one hit of food you know it's like it's like the uh, I just called to say I love you of food maybe that's the wrong song no it's the thrill Call me it, maybe it's the thriller of food that's it you still hear Thriller today and you're excited. You're like, oh my goodness, that is an amazing song. So it's the same thing. Do, 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 do. Oh, that's Billie Jean. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong. Wrong. So if it was your last meal, you would choose to watch it in front of the TV. Yeah. Who would you be eating it with? Oh, that's interesting. I would have to pick my wife because she also loves noodles and butter straight out of the pan. So, I mean, it's a match made in heaven. I'd give her a bowl too. Maybe Are we going to die together? We sure. always say we should die together in a fiery... Um, crash, like or a fireball. We want to go out in a fireball holding hands. Like drinking fireball? No, no. Like holding hands in a fireball. That sounds fun. Uh, so maybe we'll do it together. My last meal will be our last meal, and then we'll have a fireball. And it will be really nice and hot, that pasta, yes. inside the fireball. <laughs> what is a fireball? Just I a don't big know. ball of fire? We just imagine like a, like a Hollywood movie style, like we're trying to outrun it, but we don't even try. We just get swallowed by a fireball. You just succumb. <laughs> we succumb. We're like, oh, it's the pinnacle scene of the movie where we should be running from the fireball, but eh, we'll just get consumed by the fireball. Do you think it's possible right now to try and improvise a song about macaroni with butter and salt and pepper and a fireball? Dying by fireball? Yeah. Let's find out. Okay. Oh, if I had a chance, I wouldn't do a television dance. <laughs> like on Dancing with the Stars, I'd sit with my wife and eat some elbow macaroni. Eat some elbow macaroni. And then afterwards, we'd die in a giant ball of fire. After we would die in a giant ball of fire. Elbow macaroni, salt and pepper. Elbow macaroni, salt and pepper. Elbow macaroni, salt and pepper. <laughs> On a slightly out of tune guitar, thank you. <laughs> that is the best thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I don't know why Dancing with the Stars was in there. Because stars are balls of fire. Oh, good point. Yeah, that was See, probably in I your subconscious. That. I knew that. Yeah. Maybe that song will make it on the next record. <laughs> I don't think so. So when Chris told me that his last meal was a big steaming bowl of buttery, salty macaroni, the first thing I thought was, who eats macaroni without its seemingly requisite coating of creamy, gooey, often fluorescent orange cheese? Or without a slippery blanket of mayonnaise and a macaroni salad? But my second thought was Yankee Doodle. Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. Yes, that's it! Uh, macaroni? Who ever heard of anyone sticking a feather in his cap and calling it macaroni? That's ridiculous! Yeah, well, I've always thought that myself. 
Well, I mean, who would, or why would anybody call anything macaroni except macaroni? Even the Muppets on Sesame Street want to know what macaroni is doing in the classic Yankee Doodle song. And we get the answer from London's Chris Roberts. Chris is the author of a book about the history of nursery rhymes called Heavy Words, Lightly Thrown. The macaronis were a youth cult in London in the late 1760s, sort of 1769, 1770. Chris admits that when he says youth, he actually means these were young men around 20, 21, 22 years old who tended to be on a gap year between university and getting a real job. They were hugely influential, all kind of affluent young men who'd been on European tours and they brought back many things with them, including the dish macaroni from Italy, which they had kind of inordinate fondness of and they named their their club their group after the macaroni dish they used to have a supper club and they'd, they'd eat macaroni there and they were very influential very well connected and very right for satire there's a lot of stuff in the newspapers at the time in the periodicals kind of ripping them apart but they, they were terribly effeminate so kind of very very tight trousers very big hair very affected way of speaking. They they were very much in high society. One of our prime ministers was a macaroni, a guy called Charles Fox, which is kind of nice. Now they, they were kind of like the New Romantics, if you can remember them from the from the eighties with the youth cult of the New Romantics and Boy George and Duran Duran and people like that. They were they were, they were kind of like an, an 18th century version of that. And they love macaroni anyway. That's the key thing. That's where they got the name from. So would you uh, say that of, they were kind of the hipsters of their time? Very much, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's just there weren't as many of them, yeah. Their drug of choice was um, was looking like a tea made from maidenhair fern called capillaire. Um, it's very, very precious, very hard to make. Okay, so the macaronis were a bunch of high-haired, tight-pantsed, tea-drinking fashionistas. And here is how they factor into the Yankee Doodle song. The original version is British. In the early British version, there is this reference to the macaronis. And the idea is, essentially, it's a put-down of American, the, the colonials as they were. The idea that by putting a feather into your cap that's not enough to make you a macaroni. You have to do a lot more than that. You have to I don't know, have eyeliner and your hair up and your trousers in the right way and speak in a certain fashion. It, essentially, it's a put down of the American colonials to say it takes more than that to be down with the dandy youth of London town. So that's the reference to macaroni there. So this idea that somebody in, I don't know, Boston or 1770, 1771 could put a feather in their hat and strut around and pretend that they were um, fashionable young London youth, that um, wasn't enough. After Chris and I talked, I did a little bit more research on Yankee Doodle and saw on Wikipedia that the original version of the song, Sans Macaroni, is thought to be from 15th century Holland. And Doodle is spelled D-U-D-E-L. And suddenly I had an epiphany. Could the word dude come from Yankee Doodle? Dude, dude. Take it easy, dude. Oh yeah, the dude abides. The dude abides. You got it, dude. Um, yeah, it totally does. Turns out dude does come from Yankee Doodle. And there are many articles about this, but perhaps the most notable source is a journal by Gerald Cohen called Comments on Etymology. Cohen spends 129 pages connecting the Yankee Doodle dude dots. He says the foppish young men of New York City were called dudes starting in 1883. And back then, dude was spelled D-O-O-D-S, just like the doodle in Yankee Doodle. And eventually that morphed into today's spelling of D-U-D-E-S. <laughs> All right, dudes, back to macaroni. So macaroni is, of course, a pasta. But in Italy, macaroni does not specifically refer to tubular elbow-shaped pasta like it does in the United States. Macaroni is actually a generic name for dry pasta made from durum wheat or semolina. So if you're speaking about pasta generically in Italy, any shape would be called macaroni. In Italian, what do they call what we refer to as elbow macaroni? You know, it's interesting, but I've never run across that shape in Italy. That is Cliff Wright. He lives in Santa Monica, and he won a James Beard Award for his cookbook, A Mediterranean Feast. When I was a kid, I thought that pasta was invented in Italy. And then I was told that, no, noodles actually came to Italy via China. But recently, I was surprised to read that pasta may have Arabic origins. The consensus seems to be that hard wheat dried pasta was invented perhaps in North Africa, meaning like Tunisia, Algeria, or perhaps in Sicily. So the earliest evidence we have linguistically of dried pasta is from about the 12th century. But there are these other vague references to hard wheat being grown that go back as early as the 9th century. But one thing we do know for sure is that the first time 
pasta is described in such a way that we could recognize it today is from about the 12th century. And those writings are mostly from Sicily. Oh, from Sicily. Okay. So is it believed that Sicily did come before China? Yeah. In fact, China never knew pasta. The idea that pasta came from China comes from the writings and diaries of Marco Polo. And when he traveled through China, he and in Indonesia, he mentions a food that sounds very much like pasta. Uh, the thing is, if this was a new, unfamiliar food that he discovered, he would most likely use the native language's word for that food. And he didn't. He used the Latin word lasagna. So that means we know he was already familiar with pasta, that pasta already existed at the time that he left Italy. So we know that he didn't discover pasta in China. Furthermore, we also know that Chinese were not using hard wheat at that time. And the Italians are using words for pasta. And one of the words that they use for pasta is tria in the 11th and 12th century. And tria is a word in Latin and in Italian that derives from the Arabic word itria, a word that meant long threads. So that's why we have a linguistic indication that its origins may be Arab. I love this. This is so fascinating to me. Chris says the Arabs who most likely first started making pasta were nomadic. So they would carry around balls of dough with them. And Cliff thinks the first pasta was probably similar to what we know today as pearl pasta. Of course, I had to ask Cliff about America's favorite vehicle for macaroni, a dish that has passed through the lips of so many children, it almost seems like the law to serve it to them. Macaroni and cheese. Macaroni and cheese as a dish that Americans know certainly became very popular in 1937 when the Kraft Company put it into a box but it obviously existed before then. We've got Thomas Jefferson, who was quite an Italophile. You know, he goes off to Italy on various diplomatic missions, and because he was our first gastronomic president, he was interested in a variety of Italian foods. He brought back with him a pasta extrusion machine. Jefferson more than likely encountered pasta with cheese in Italy, and the cheese would have been Parmesan. But the main cheese in the American colonies was cheddar cheese, so it's likely that it began to be made with cheddar cheese. But as far as macaroni and cheese goes, that's the most elemental type of food using macaroni that we know, and the earliest example of that is in an anonymous cookbook called the Liber de Coquina, which was written in Latin by someone who was involved with the Neapolitan court under Charles II of Anjou in Naples. And in that book, the recipe is called de lasanas, which means on lasagna, and it is made by sheets of lasagna that are cooked in water and then tossed with grated cheese. That would be the first evidence of macaroni and cheese. Suddenly, I have a new favorite president. Thank you, Thomas Jefferson. Thank you. But you know what, Thomas Jefferson? Chris Ballou doesn't need your stinking cheese. It gives him eczema. Chris Ballou remains happy with his simple preparation of macaroni, butter, salt, and pepper. Now that I have talked about these noodles, I think I need to go home and actually make a big bowl of noodles of butter, which is great because I can actually have my last meal frequently. It's not the kind of thing that's unattainable. So I can uh, go home and pretend it's my last meal today. Because who knows? That ball of fire, it's not going to knock on the door. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's going to happen. So every meal could be your last meal, people. So make sure it's a good one. Casper Baby Pants actually has quite a few songs that revolve around food. So before I let Chris Ballou leave the studio, I squeezed one last song out of him. I have a song about banana bread. My father passed away about two or three years ago, and um, he was a bit of a songwriter. We collaborated while he was alive. And then going through some notes and books and papers and stuff of his, I found this song, this unfinished song called Banana Bread. And it turns out it's because uh, my niece Lisa was his caregiver in his later years, and she would buy too many bananas, and he would always tell her as they were going rotten, those got to turn into banana bread because she made great banana bread. So he started writing this song for her called Banana Bread, but he didn't finish it, and I found it um, kind of partially made, and I decided to finish the banana bread, and now it goes like this. And it features my dad's classic Midwestern dark humor. Okay, here we go. Banana bread, banana bread, we can be banana bread. We're not pretty, but we're not dead. We can be banana bread. You brought us home from the grocery. We look so snappy. Put us on the countertop over there. We were so happy. Then you forgot about us. Lunch after lunch. 
now we are a fruit fly covered brown and bummed out bunch but banana bread banana bread we can be banana bread we're not pretty but we're not dead we can be banana bread we can be banana bread once upon a time we were so yellow Cheery, bright, and smiling, a bunch of happy fellows. Then we got forgotten, now it's almost too late. But you can still make us into something tasty to put on your plate. Banana bread, banana bread, we can be banana bread. We're not pretty, but we're not dead. We can be banana bread, we can be banana bread. All right, three-part harmony, here we come on. Banana, 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 banana. Me and the boys have been together for so long. We grew up on a banana tree and learned to sing this song. All the young bananas learned it in case they get forgotten. So people don't throw them out just because they look a little bit rotten. Banana bread, banana bread, we can be banana bread. We're not pretty, but we're not dead. We can be banana bread, we can be banana bread. We can be banana bread, we can be banana bread. I love it so Woo, much. It's so you. good. Thank you, thank you. And that is Chris Ballou's last meal. Chris is the singer and guitarist for the band's Presidents of the United States and Casper Baby Pants. And Casper has a brand new album out now called Away We Go. He's also releasing a holiday album in December called Winter Party, and you should probably buy them both. We also heard from Chris Roberts, author of Heavy Words Lightly Thrown, and Cliff Wright, author of the cookbook A Mediterranean Feast original music by prom queen and this is a brand new podcast so i'd be so grateful if you subscribed and left a nice review on itunes so more people can find us i'm rachel bell and until next time this is your last meal